State officials and federal regulators are still considering the controversial proposal from Kinder Morgan Corporation and Tennessee Gas to place a natural gas transmission pipeline across northwestern Massachusetts. Tonight, Connecting Point correspondent Carolee McGrath continues her reporting on that project. So we're going to continue our discussion with Benji Borowski of the Coalition to Lower Energy Costs and Representative Paul Mark. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Representative Mark, I wanted to ask you, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission will ultimately have the final say in that. They extended the deadline for intervention applications, and I know that you had filed one as well. What's the status of that, and, and what are your feelings as far as whether or not they'll approve the project? So uh, myself and several other legislators, we actually filed to be interveners in the case before the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities utilities as well, and they, they denied us, which was a little surprising and disappointing. Uh, FERC, the deadline is January 15th, so as we record this, I, I don't know ultimately if they're going to approve me or not, but I have filed to be an intervener. I know uh, my other colleagues in Franklin County have also both filed to be interveners in the case, and uh, I think it would be good because it would allow us to have access to materials that uh, wouldn't be available to the general public, and I think in a position where representing 42,000 people and five communities, two of which would be very heavily impacted by this uh, project, proposed project, uh, I think it's helpful for me to be able to get as much information as, as possible. Do you, uh, um, Benji, if you could explain a little bit, um, and your group has brought up this point uh, in the information that they've provided, but that pipelines are constrained during the winter months and part of the summer. Can you explain that and how could improvements to the existing pipelines alleviate that without the need to build a new um, extension? Our local gas utilities like Columbia and Berkshire uh, they sign up for long-term contracts of capacity on the pipelines. Um, they are required, they are legally obligated to serve their customers' demand. So if they have a need, they sign up for a contract and that is approved by the local uh, utilities commission. Um, and they, they have first access basically to the pipelines. And it is the generators that get bumped off when the pipelines are full. So in the winter, it's really cold and people need to heat their homes, cook their food, and businesses, businesses need to run. Uh, those, those demands are served by your gas utilities. That's use, increasingly using up all of the space on the pipelines throughout the winter, and there's none left over for the electric generators. So the natural gas generators that are fired by natural gas, uh, basically, when, when there's no pipeline capacity left, we don't use those generators, even though they're, mo they're our cleanest, most efficient, and most flexible generators, the generators that can help balance renewable energy the best. Uh, and instead, when we cannot use those generators, we revert to coal or oil. And I'm not talking about just a little slight reversion to coal and oil. At times during the winter, coal and oil produce over 42% of our electricity. And for entire months at a time, they've produced over 26% of our electricity. So there's a huge huge emissions and economic impact to that. With those pipelines being constrained, one area of concern, uh, certainly for you and the people who live in your district, is eminent domain. FERC can, if they approve the project, go in, right, and take property uh, to make this happen. Um, I, obviously, that's a big concern. What can be done about that? So it is a big concern, and, and FERC ultimately, as a branch of the federal government, has the final say. But in Massachusetts, we have an interesting process here. We're the only state in the entire country that in our constitution, our state constitution, we have something called Article 97, which provides that for any land taking in this state, there must be a two-thirds majority vote of the House and the Senate to pass it. Uh, every land taking bill that has ever come up, I filed some myself in the past, has always been unanimous because what happens is you come to the local representative and the local senator and they always file it because it's something the town wants, it's something the area wants, it has a benefit to the region. It has never happened that I've seen and it never happened that I'm aware of that since Article 97 protection has existed in our state constitution that the local representative has gotten up and said I won't file this bill, I am opposed to this bill passing and the other two-thirds of the legislature have voted against the will of the local people, basically. It's never happened. So it's going to be an interesting test. If we have a vote on it before the full House and Senate and it is rejected in the state legislature, will FERC be able to overrule us? Now, I mean, you can make an argument ultimately that federal law will trump state constitution even, but where it's never been tested, I think it's at least going to be an interesting case in federal court, possibly all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and that could cause delays that might make this project uh, financially unattractive to the company. So on your side, your big concern is how ratepayers will be affected, and I'd like you to explain how they will be affected. And also, um, you know, 
nobody wants to pay high um, energy costs in the wintertime, especially those who don't have a lot of extra money. So I'd like you to explain that. Yeah, so when you say energy, it, 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 it's, a, it's an all-encompassing term, and it means both electricity and heating. So uh, you, have, you have rate payers on, on both sides there. You have electric rate payers, and you have uh, natural gas rate payers. Uh, unfortunately, you have a lot of people in New England, a lot of households who still heat with oil as well. And an interesting study just came out using 2014 data in Massachusetts called the Home Energy Affordability Gap Study. And basically what it, what it, the main conclusion is that there are over 600,000 households in Massachusetts that cannot afford their energy bills. And the gap by which they cannot afford their energy bills is over $1,900. And when it comes to essential goods, like paying for energy, healthcare, education, shelter, you forego one or the other. So these people who struggle to pay their electricity bills, if they choose to pay those, they have to forego something else. And it was absolutely shocking, shocking to read that. And you're saying that the pipeline will help alleviate that? Well, it just so happens that Berkshire and Franklin counties are two of the poorest, account, poorest counties. And uh, the home energy burden on, on low-income people in those two counties in particular, excluding the islands in Massachusetts, the burden was the highest in the state. Over 50% of household income had to be devoted to energy bills. OK, last question to Representative Mark. I any time a project like this comes up, even if it was a solar array in a small town or a wind farm or something, people generally will not be happy if it's in their backyard. Is that just kind of what's going on here in I your district? It, I think it goes beyond that. I don't think it's a matter of just people don't want this in their backyard. I think it's a matter of what is good long term for the environment? What is good long term for sustainable future? What is good long term for these communities? Is there What are the benefits versus the cost that the communities will will shoulder if, if they are asked to host this pipeline and host these compressor stations. And are those benefits, do they outweigh? And, and the people, overwhelmingly, over 95% of the people that have contacted me about this, and a lot of people contact me about this, have, have said, no, we don't want this. And I, I, I've mentioned before, uh, the town of Greenfield right now has a moratorium on gas service. They do have gas service. Uh, they would benefit, in theory, by this moratorium being lifted if the pipeline was expanded. The city council in Greenfield has sent me a resolution. They do not want the pipeline. They stand in solid with the towns in the region. So I, I, right there, it, it's something that isn't in their backyard, Greenfield, because it wouldn't pass through Greenfield, and it would, in theory, benefit them. And they are still taking a stand against it because they're looking long term. So I don't think it's a NIMBY thing at all. And I don't think this discussion is going to end anytime soon. <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot more debate um, in the coming weeks. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Benji Borowski and uh, Representative Mark. I appreciate it.